everyone, I'm Arlene Dickinson. Thanks for joining me on my podcast. It's no secret that small business is a big deal for TELUS. Earlier this year, TELUS helped make things better for small businesses through their pledge to stand with owners. In continuing their support for owners across Canada, they are excited to introduce the Owners Advantage Plan, an exclusive mobility plan tailored to help business owners stay connected to their family, business, and community. The Owners Advantage Plan offers a wide variety of benefits designed to provide greater value and more flexibility than ever before, including yearly device upgrades, endless data, same-day device repair, and access to on-demand virtual healthcare, all on the world's fastest mobile network in the world. Visit telus.com slash owners advantage. Hello everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of reInvention. Today, Arlene chats with the international best-selling author, Linwood Barclay. Linwood is one of those lucky people that knew exactly what he wanted to do from a young age. Right. But although he identified his passion, being able to pursue it was another story. The loss of his father at an early age left him responsible for carrying on the family business and putting his own dreams on hold. But after realizing that there's nothing wrong with having someone else handle the generic work he was tasked with, he embarked on chasing a career in writing. That translated into decades of writing for newspapers, followed by his tremendously successful career as an author of 23 books and counting. Linwood, it is a real pleasure to speak to you today. I, you know, I, I've read your books for a long time, and I've been such a huge fan of your writing, and and I get so enthralled by the not just the the storyline that you create, but the actual words you use are just so. Uh, I, I think there's such a special art to being able to craft words in a way that every word really does matter, and it just resonates with you. And you are such such a star of that and I so it's a pleasure to talk to you today and thank you so much and talk to you about and and talk to you about reinvention thank you it's been a pleasure I'm really glad to be part of this today it's fun thanks how are, how are you doing right now we're good uh you know going a little stir crazy like everybody and now we're of course in our new kind of uh mini lockdown I guess and and so we're you know, we kind of saw this one coming, so we we loaded up on a bunch of things last week. We got lots of popcorn and vodka, so I think we'll get through this. <laughs> so, <laughs> two I, essentials. <laughs> sure, there's probably other things people need, but we're not sure what they are. Um, <laughs> you know, just, and I'm, you know, when you know, I've worked from home since about 1994. So when like most, you know, when I was started writing a column for the Toronto Star, so working from home is not anything new for me. So that's fine. Uh, and I'm in the thick of, I'm just about finished the first draft of what would be the 2022 book. That's fine. But once that's done and it gets to be winter and there's nothing we could do, I think we're all going to kind of just, it's going to be like the Donner party or something. I'm afraid. I don't know. We'll get to that. <laughs> have you been, have you been using the pandemic as creatively? I'm curious, like, you know, I, I work with creative people all day and I, I know that some people are finding the lockdown and the lack of interaction socially really difficult for them creatively because they're not exposed to the things that actually stimulate their creative minds. Are you finding as a writer, it's the opposite? That has, that particular part has a problem because I've worked sort of in isolation for years. I mean, when you, you know, you write novels and you're kind of just totally on your own anyway. So that hasn't had an impact on my work. I think what a lot of authors are struggling with and debating is whether we're going to include the pandemic in what in our work, you know, unless right. you're historical novels or something. But I mean, I, I'm sort of thinking every every novel that I write from now on, does it take place in 2019 or earlier, or do I work it into the story? Do I recognize that it's happened? Do I have people meeting in bars to talk about it, you know, in the investigation, or do I ever does every character wear a mask? I mean, what? You know, do do and, and and the book I'm writing now is set because it'll come out in 2022. I'm setting it in that year, and I'm kind of assuming or hoping that we'll have been past this, and I can reference it, but right. you know, I make mention of it. And and as far as just even doing a sort of a pandemic thriller, I mean, there's only like 5,000 other authors who are debating whether to do that too. <laughs> That's true. 
school was written in what 1979 or 80 by Stephen King. It was called The Stand. And so we're not going to top that. And does anybody want to read about it? You know, once we get through this, do you want to read about this? And I'm not sure many of us will. I think we'll be interested in reading sort of nonfiction accounts and how our political leaders either handled it well or didn't. But yeah. in fiction, I, I don't know. So I'm kind of kind of trying to pretend at least creatively that it hasn't isn't happening yeah i kind of i like that personally because i we are so inundated right now and do i want to go back and read a book later on that, that references it and eh, i'm not sure i do you know like i think it's just it is a moment in time that we're all you know hating and and maybe sometimes bringing something you hate back into written words is not actually always a good idea you know and i just read a wonderful novel not too long ago by the wonderful American writer Carl Hyacin, who writes these sort of satirical, it's kind of if John, Jonathan Swift wrote thrillers, they would be what Carl Hyacin writes. And he sets his in kind of a post-pandemic world where it's referred to and talked about, but it's over. Yeah. And, and uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, I guess we'll just see how this all plays out. Yeah. Well, listen, let's just, let's just go back a bit to the, our listeners and, and, and for our listeners, sorry. And, and talk about your background because I, you know, I, I know you, I, I have read your books. I, I thought I knew you, you know, fairly, you know, reasonably well because of that. But then I started, you know, doing some homework on you and found out so many fascinating things. So, and I don't think many people who read your novels would know kind of the, change you had and the reinvention you had at a very young age you were you're you're you were uh, raised by your parents in the states and um and then you came to canada but but when you were 16 tell me a little bit about what happened when you were 16 years old yeah so my my um i'll try to make this a long story so um <laughs> well if anyone can write it can craft a story right now you can so my father was a commercial artist he was an illustrator so if you were to look, you know, the pages of Life Look, Saturday Evening Post magazine, all through the 50s, you saw car ads, which at the time were illustrations and not photography, it's very likely that the person who drew those cars was my dad. Oh, wow. In 1959, when I was just turning four, uh, my dad took a job with the uh, William Mark Templeton Advertising uh, ties in Agency in Toronto, which was uh, run by the brother of Charles Templeton. And so my parents moved to Canada just as I was turning four. And... And then um, as the 60s progressed, photography killed what my dad did. All the ads were now photographs of cars and not illustrations. And so my parents you know, embarked on this sort of bizarre new career. In 66, they bought a cottage resort park near Bob Cajun in the Kawarthas Lakes region of Ontario. And so I was sort of uprooted and at the age of 11, we were, we were, we were up there doing that. And then at, when I was 16, um, my father was diagnosed with lung cancer and, you know, I guess in, in about February or March of that year of 1971 and by November he was, he was dead. And so I was basically thrust into running the whole, like doing everything, all the work at the camp. I mean, my mother managed it. Um, but I was, you know, I was basically did everything and had to run this place and also to some degree was looking after, an 11 year older a brother, 11 years older than him, who was dealing with schizophrenia and so forth. So I kind of grew up overnight at 16. And wow. I didn't have those kind of wild, kind of drunken party, wild abandoned years, teenage years that, you know, that, that lots of us get to have. So I just kind of grew up overnight. And, and that was, that was the most pivotal and remains for me I think the most pivotal moment in my entire life was that moment when my dad passed away and because I just had to grow up and so and I think that's to this day affects me because because at 16 I had to do everything I still assume that no one else knows how to do anything and so my own you know my own kids who are now in their 30s it's like well you know, I better help them with this or I should advise them on this. And they know perfectly well how to conduct their lives. But I'm always worried that I should sort of step in and maybe I need to help here, but I don't. And, but that was so pivotal for me. And then at the age of 22, I met the, this lovely woman to whom I'm still married, named Nitha, and, and uh, at Trent University. And I thought, I don't want to run a fishing camp 
for the rest of my life. That's not what I want to do. And so I left, much to the horror and, and bitterness from my mom that I didn't want to stay and run her business. And I got a reporting job at the Peterborough Examiner at age 22. So that was the start of my sort of moving in that direction of writing for a living. And, uh, and you know, I think I got hired at the Examiner for $125 a week, which actually back then was not a lot of money. Um, and, uh, and so I, you know, I spent a couple of years there and a couple of years at a small paper in Oakville in 1981, I landed at the Toronto Star where they hired me as an editor. So just let's, let's pause for a second on that story because I think about what you just told me about, first of all, um, losing your father at 16 would have been highly traumatic, um, especially if you're taking care of the rest of your family. And then you had your mother's expectations that you were going to continue on with the family business. So you do that. And, 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 I, and I love the way you have characterized what has done to you as an adult in terms of responsibility and feeling like you will have to be the person to solve everybody else's problems all the time because everybody was looking to you at that young age. And, and, I, and I think that then would have played heavily on your decision at 22 to leave the family business. I mean, what, for people who work in the family business, I mean, my kids, a lot of my kids work with me. How do you, how do you help them understand that they still have to go pursue their own thing? Because they're, we're all afraid of disappointing our parents. We're all afraid of saying to them, I don't want to do this anymore, mom. You know, I don't want to live your dream. I want to live mine. How did you do that? How did you get the courage to do that? Well, it was DC. And, um, and a large part of it was, and not to get too deeply into it, but I, my mom was a was was a difficult person, and not a barrel of laughs to live with, and very controlling, and and uh, over every aspect of your life, you know, you'd want to, you to make sure you weren't doing this or that. And she was a difficult person, who was not kind of very good at seeing another person's point of view. And I knew that certainly I I was I wanted to get married. I met, you know I was young, but I wanted to get married to to, to Nitha. And I knew that I could not bring her into that dynamic and live at that that place with my mom there. I just thought that's a recipe for disaster. And I had um, I had acquired over those years after my father died. Uh, there were a lot of men, my father's age or younger, who came to that camp to go fishing on a vacation who kind of took me under their wing and became mentors for me. So when it's, when, you know, sort of after that point with Father's Day, I think of like all of these different guys, you know, who were, who were lovely to me and, 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 their, and their spouses. And I remember going to one of them who was, they were like a second set of parents for me. And I went to see them with, with Nitha in the months leading up to, to getting married. And I remember them saying to me, this lady sitting here is your responsibility now and not your mom. And it doesn't take, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out how to cut grass and clean up boats and, and fix steps on a cottage and so forth. Somebody else could do that. She can hire somebody. And that kind of gave me this, the, this courage to think I have to get out of this and extricating myself from that camp and from my mother's control was an immensely difficult process. Yeah. And I and I vowed from that time, even when I was just still almost a kid, that when I had kids, that I would not run their lives, that I would let them make their decisions and do what they had to do. And I would not guilt that guilt trip them into doing what I wanted them to do. Yeah, it's that's such a I mean, there's two really important lessons there. I think when you take people often think about mentorship and, you know, I need to find a mentor and they I think they have to go and find somebody who's, you know, super successful or has done so many things in life and has all the credentials in the world. But mentorship is exactly what those people in your, you know, in the campground gave you these, these people who were there, who were adults who just took the time to listen and coach you and, and give you, you know, um, their words of wisdom so that you could make your own choices. And I, and I, I love that because mentorship can happen anywhere. I mean, you can mentor somebody in any situation, no matter who you are, right? Yeah, I, I mean, these, these men who were so stepped up to sort of guide me, I mean, one, one of them was a North York building inspector. Another one was a, a private detective from Buffalo. 
who used to come up and stay at our play, at our camp two months, uh, two weeks out of every year. And another guy who worked in a, like a, a steel mill in Pennsylvania who had been fishing Pigeon Lake for like 50 years. And these were the guys that I went to for, you know, for wisdom and advice. And, and I, I've been their debt. The other thing that you said that I, I, I'd like to just touch on before you carry on with your, your life story around what happened next is that you talked about your, you know, how hard it was to deal with your mom and, and to tell her what was going on. And, and, you know, I've had so many young people come up to me and say, you know, I don't know what to do with my life. I'm not sure what I should be. My parents want me in law school. My parents want me in med school. My parents want me to be, you know, a dentist, whatever those professions are. And they're all in school and they all feel stuck. And not, and not everybody. When I say all, I mean the ones who've asked me these specific questions. And they'll come up to me and say, I, I can't disappoint my family. I can't tell my mom and dad that I don't want to be a doctor. Or I don't want to be a lawyer. And so they find themselves going through university and taking education that isn't really important to them from a, what they want to be in life, but doing it because they want to please their parents. And I, and I really think what you just said is so important that we, if we're going to reinvent ourselves, we have to be prepared to perhaps disappoint the people who we think um, we want to please the most. And it's very hard. Yeah. Those stories that I, and I hear those stories every once in a while about young people who are being pressured by their parents to, you know, follow into their career, become a lawyer, and, and just as what you're talking about. And I find those stories really heartbreaking yeah. because I think we're, you know, a lot of us really don't know what to do. You know, like we yeah. kind of, we hit our 20s and we think, well, do I want to do this, do that? And then some of us are very fortunate, like myself, we think, I really want to do this. Like maybe yeah. I want to dance or I want to be an actor or I want to be a musician. I want to do something in the arts. I want to write. And I think if you have that passion and you know that's what you want to do, to have someone sort of tamp that down and say, no, no, that's no way to make a living. You need to be a dentist or an accountant. Those, that, those kind of stories break my heart. And, yeah, me too. You know, I just think that if we, if there's something in our, if they have this sort of in our spirit that there's something we really need to do, we need to try to do it. Yeah, I agree. And I, and, and, and as hard as it is, um, this is where I think regret comes from. You know, later in life where you go, shoot, why didn't I do that thing? What was I afraid of? Why, what was stopping me? So my, you know, my parents or my girlfriend or my, my, you know, boss or whoever said, no, I can't, but I, I should have just let myself try. And, and these are the stories where you really hear about people who's, who go on then to do something amazing. I mean, you, you went on to become an editor and, yep. and when you were an editor, you were, you actually had. And then you were, you, as, a, as a columnist, you were also doing a lot of work in the political scenes, right? You were writing about politics a lot. Tell me about that journey and, and, and what that was like. Well, I had been a reporter for four years. And then I was at this paper that was, was literally being shut down. It was going to go under in Oakville. And so I had applied at the Toronto Star. And I went in for an interview uh, to get a reporting job. And the editor, the city editor at the time, she said to me, well, we don't need reporters. What we're desperate for are editors. Do you have a lot of editing experience? And I said, uh, yes, sure. <laughs> Whatever you need. <laughs> so, Never done it before, but I'm really good at it. I've done a t little bit of it. And so I was put to work as uh, on trial as a copy editor. On, uh, and I did sort of three shifts on, uh, actually I had, and after I had that other paper had closed, I'd actually been given a job at the sort of competing paper it was part of a merger. So I had a job, but I thought I have to get out of here. I don't want to be here. And so I kind of, uh, I think my third day at my uh, other job, I phoned in sick and I did a trial uh, shift on the copy desk at the star. And I did three shifts over the week and they hired me. And so I was hired as an editor and I was, you know, I was, I was good at it. I was a good editor and made a couple of immense mistakes that somehow got overlooked just and passed my probation and they kept me. And, <laughs> and so I was on the editing track for, I guess, the better part of 12 years. I was, I was hired as a copy editor and then I became assistant city editor. And then I was news editor and I was laying out with others, all the, the news pages of the star and the front page and all that kind of stuff. And um, chief copy editor. Then I was editor of the life section for the better part of three years. And so I did all of that for about 12 years. And 
and it was a lot of it was a lot of fun and especially you know working on a news desk when you come to work at three o'clock in the afternoon and you've got all these pages to lay out and you've got all these photographs and all these news stories and you've got to put it together and you've got seven hours let's go and you make a paper that was great fun and i loved that job and and uh and the hours flew by but then in 93 an opportunity came up to do a humor column and i applied and got it and i did that three columns a week for the better part of 14 years and it was i always say it's a, it was allegedly a humor column because when you write humor or satire in a paper if there's not a big label that says this is satire there will always be some reader who thinks it's true right and, like one time way back when I, I had written a piece about places to send your kids on the on the March break. And I said, why not send them to Mir Space Station Camp, which was that orbiting Russian satellite. Send your kids to Mir Space Station Camp, send them, dress them warmly and send them with lots of duct tape because there's lots of holes in the hull. <laughs> and I swear, I swear to God, a guy phoned the next paper, uh, phoned the paper the next day and he said, you didn't put in a phone number. Now... <laughs> And I thought, my, he says, my daughter would love to do that. I'm thinking, wouldn't you want to be his kid? Guess where you're going? You're going. Yeah, space. you're going to space camp. <laughs> no one's been, but you're going to go. <laughs> I did, you know, I did three columns a week. Some of them were sort of domestic family humor. And then um, uh, a lot of sort of political satire out of that group. I mean, I did a, I did a, a, a humor book uh, called Mike Harris Made Meet My Dog, based on a certain premier of the day who I was not a fan of. And, uh, and so I was doing all that. But, you know, the, and the thing that I hadn't mentioned, which kind of is part of the story, is that I was writing novels, mystery novels, in my teens and into my 20s. And, that, and when I finished university, I thought, well, you know, I think I'll just get a job as a best-selling novelist. And that didn't work out because... Uh, all you can't just say you want a job as a best-selling novelist? Like <laughs> I like a best-selling novelist position, please. And... <laughs> And so that, and I was sending my manuscripts off to all sorts of publishers. I used to like to say that, that I could go to a mailbox and put one of these manuscripts into the mailbox and it would be returned by the time I got home from the publisher saying, we do not want this. And, and so I'd written several novels, none of which were published and we can all be immensely grateful for that, especially me. Um, but after doing the columns, you know, for a few years and so forth, I thought I really like to get back to what I always wanted to do when I was when I was in my teens and early twenties, and that became another, as you say, reinvention, which kind of happened about fourteen years ago. So, just staying with that period of time where you you transitioned from running the campground and and doing the you know kind of being the the handy guy who does everything there and supporting your mom to you know being an editor and a reporter and a and a columnist. Um, I actually, uh, one of my guests on this podcast has been Rex Hupke from the Chicago Tribune, who I, I just, I don't know if you read his columns, but you should. I think there's a lot of similarities in the, in the storyline. He, uh, at any rate, you were, you, when you're there, I know you, and I just want to talk about politics for just a minute, I, not, not to be political, but just because I think it's fascinating. You know, you wrote that book about Mike Harris. Um, I, I don't think you're, you've been a fan of Doug Ford or, or you know, his brother, Rob. We did a Doug Ford book last year in the midst of did all you? the it's called Ford <laughs> Abomination, but yes, carry on. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, do you think though, when you, you look at, when you look at Doug and what he's done relative to the pandemic, do you think politicians ever really change who they are in terms of, you know, like can, can things like this actually change people to be perhaps a little more in touch with their constituents, a little more in touch with the world. I, and I'm not saying he is or isn't, but I'm just curious what you think. I don't know. You know, right now I'm reading Obama's book. I talked about it this week and I'm just dived into it. And I think he was the one who said that, well, he's talking about being a president, but I think politi politics, politics doesn't change who you are, but I think it shows who you are. I think that's paraphrasing what he said. And, and it shows who you really are and what you're made of. And and sometimes I think that we're rather disappointed in what we see when we when we people when we see what people are really made of, and I think you know you elect people to make decisions, and a lot of times they're they're paralyzed in making them because they're so afraid of displeasing this group or that group that they end up going down the middle and really accomplishing nothing. Mm -hmm. And and I mean I remember when I was a kid and one of these people who mentored you know kind of a mentor to me was had said. 
even a bad decision is better than no decision because at least you're moving forward. And then if you see that that was wrong, you can change course and go back. But if you just do nothing, that's just, there's just, you're not moving forward at all. It, it's it, what, just again, not to, I have some real mixed feelings. Like part of me really wants to dive into this because I actually think part of reinvention through this pandemic is going to be how we think about politics and you know Trump has you know and what's happened in the states has definitely changed the way people think about politicians and who they are and how they act um, and I, I certainly don't think it's for being for the better but that's a personal view I know when I tweet anything about politics and have any sort of opinion I mean it's just it's fascinating to me the the vitriol and the the, the views people have that are are fairly, you know, unapologetic about letting anybody have an opinion. I mean, and I think what you just said about politicians trying to please the masses, you know, trying to not alienate anybody for the vote instead of saying, well, this is just the right thing to do and I'm going to stick by that is, is something we need. We need more people with the courage of their convictions in politics, I think. As you know, and it even reminds me, when I was the, um, the life's, the editor, an editor of the Star, and, uh, and sometimes I was oversaw or I was the editor for various columnists. And, and, and I think this was a lesson I learned before becoming a columnist. And that was, you know, I, one of the people that I was uh, for a while editor for was Michelle Landsberg. And I can remember once um, sitting in my office and this guy called up and he was just livid. And he said, Michelle's column on Friday just infuriated me, but I thought the one on Monday made me even more angry. I can't believe that she would say that. And then their Saturday column drove me nuts. And I thought, you read her every day. You never <laughs> reading her column. And I thought, you'd rather be a columnist who angered people and got them kind of riled up because you had an opinion than a columnist who didn't provoke any reaction at all. Right. And I thought that's a really interesting lesson. So, I mean, if you're willing to take a stand, you know, you're going to maybe alienate 40% of the people and please 60%. But if you don't take any stand, like just nobody cares about you. Right. And, and, and I think that's, that's true of politics. And, uh, and, you know, that's, I mean, my, one of my outlets, now, you know, I've had a column since 2006. When I, when I retired, I, I quit the paper early because the books were doing well. Um, but Twitter is my outlet now sometimes. And I tweet political stuff all the time. And, and I know. <laughs> Trump stuff stuff all the time. And, and every once in a while, someone will say, you know, uh, I like your books or whatever. So, but you, you, know, just, you should just write your books and keep your opinions to yourself. And I think, yeah, yeah that's why I became a writer to keep my opinion to myself. <laughs> exactly. Well, and that you, you hear that a lot, this, this idea of staying in your lane. I get that. Stay in your lane, Arlene. Like, what does that mean? I mean, my lane is a human. That's my lane. And I get to have opinions on things. Or you hear, you know, people saying to, you know, musicians, you know, just play the music. We don't want to hear what you actually think, or just write the books. We don't want to hear any of these things. I, I, I think if you want to reinvent society, we need more opinion, not less. We need more people sharing opinion respectfully and debating. And, and you can have extreme opinion. I mean, as a columnist, you're an opinionist. You're not, you're not a journalist when you're writing a column you're, that's on, you know, like, um, satire or, or something like that. You're you're an opinion writer. I mean, I, I always see people always you know jump all over Rex Murphy for the same thing, whether you know you like him or not. That's his opinion. It, he's you know he's not he's not writing a fact. He's giving his opinion on fact. So it, it's very interesting. So you go from there, um, and then you 14 years ago tell me about the next reinvention. So you know I, my first. Um... I, my first crime novel was a book called Bad Move that came out in 2004, and I, which I did with Bantam Books in the U.S. And I wrote, it was about a character named Zach Walker, and I wrote four Zach Walker novels, uh, which collectively sold, I don't know, 80 copies or something. And <laughs> it, I doubt that. So I was, I was still doing like 120 columns a year for the Toronto Star. And in my, you know, spare time and whatever, I was writing these Zach Walker mysteries. And they hadn't really done a lot. Um, and so I had a little, you know, my heart to heart with my literary agent. And she said, um, these are good books, 
But funny, you know, comic thrillers are never big sellers. It might be something to think about, which is to do a dark thriller, not part of a series, a standalone, and it needs to be, quote, a big book. And, and so I started thinking, well, what could I do? And I would send her ideas and she'd say, I've read that before, or that's not very good or whatever. And then I woke up one morning at five and I just had this idea about a young girl who wakes up and um, uh, her family's gone. You know, she just wakes up one morning, her mom or dad, her brother are gone. And 25 years go by and she's never know what happened, how they disappeared in the night. And, and, you know, and 25 years later, she thinks, you know, are they dead? Or, you know, did somebody come to the house one night and murder them all and, and not find me? Or did they decide to leave and not take me with them? And which would be worse? Would it be worse to find out that your whole family was dead or that they left and didn't want you? And so I sent this idea to her in an email at 830. And she phoned me almost immediately. She said, that's it. That's a hook for a great thriller. And because she's an agent and she likes to know plot and so she said, what happened to the family? And I said, I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. She said, that's okay. that's okay. You'll figure that out. So I wrote that book in two months about, and we started sending it around. And all of a sudden we had a, a big offer from a U.S. publisher. And then we had a bigger offer from a German publisher. And then an even bigger offer than that from a UK publisher. And so, um, and that's when I took a year's leave of absence from the star and then never did come back. But, and so that book, that, that idea that just came out of nowhere at five o'clock in the morning changed my life completely. Wow. And that book has sold, I don't know, it's probably an honest, probably sold in various languages around the world, probably at least 3 million copies. It was the single best-selling novel of the year in the UK in 2008. It got picked by a show called Richard and Judy in the UK, which was like getting being picked as an Oprah book. And it became the fastest selling book ever in that wow. TV book club. You know, it was selling like, you know, they say that in Canada, bestseller is like five or 10,000 copies. We were selling, I think, 5,000 copies a day through the summer of 2008. So that really, that, that just, completely changed our lives in that you know now i quit the day job i quit writing the column because doing 120 columns a year plus a book a year was killing me yeah. and so now i could just worry about books and and so you know and that was so that's 2008 and ever since you know i that's what i do i i'm i'm on a kind of what they call a book of your treadmill when you know if you write thrillers you know if you're Michael Connolly or Lee Child or Daniel Silva, there's an expectation we're going to get a book a year from you, as opposed to, you know, a John Irving who might do one every four or five years or whatever, like the sort of like literary fiction. Us, us guys who are to toiling in the trenches writing genre, we want stuff from you on a regular basis. So that was another reinvention for me. I, I left newspapers, I quit, you know, it was really, and my wife and I would have these long walks around 2006 about whether. I should just quit being a staffer at the Toronto Star and just write books and go. And I thought, who quits a job with a dental plan? That's <laughs> true. Not a dental plan. Like, why would I quit? They don't. And, and my wife said, we'll figure that out, you know. So I quit. That's what I did. I, I, what is it like to, to have that moment of, I mean, you know, years of trying to, you know, perfect your craft, writing papers, doing all the things you're doing, and then you're selling 5,000 books a day one day. Like, do you, do you sometimes wake up and go, holy shit, like, how did this happen? Yes, yes, very much so. Uh, it's very surreal. And it was particularly surreal for the UK thing because it wasn't even happening on my home turf. You know, I'm here in Ontario, and a few thousand miles away, there are massive uh, posters in the tube and, and you know, at the airport. Yeah wall of my book and I'm not seeing any of it I'm over here by the time I got over there um it was still going on a bit but it kind of you know I was there, got there about three months after I was over there for an event and um but it did it's and a lot of it has felt surreal you know I mean three four years ago I mean they made a they made a tv series out of one of my books in France and so we went over towards the end of the shoot to this lovely little, little village on the north coast there and 
And, you know, like there's 50 people making a TV show. And I'm thinking, this is all happening because I wrote a book called The Accident. And that still seemed like unbelievable. So a lot of it has felt very, very surreal. And, and, and but it's funny, you know, it's, it's as my agent sometimes says, or as my wife has said, be careful what you wish for, because, um, you know, once you, you have that kind of success, then you're thinking, well, the next book really can't be a piece of crap. It's got to be good. And I, I remember I sent a tongue in cheek email to my UK editor and I said to him, uh, how many books do I have to do before I can just mail it in? You know, just write a piece of crap and you guys will publish it. And he said, 15. <laughs> Not great. So I get the book 16. I just don't care. And <laughs> Well, maybe it's 25. So, you know, you really can't, you're not allowed to do that. And, you know, and there are a lot of authors out there, authors that we'd love to, you know, they get to a certain point, you think, oh man, they're just coasting. And then others like, you know, one of my idols, Stephen King, who I think is turning out some of the most ambitious work he's ever done now. But I thought, you know, it's, it's, uh, it can be, it's a challenge to try to, to, you know, you sit down every year to write another book and you think, how can I give people what they wanted in all the other books? And make it similar in that regard, but also make it fresh and make it something different. Quick Stephen King story. Tell me about when you first when you met him. So I found out um, uh, I found out about eight years ago or nine years ago that he was kind of, that he was a fan, and then he had written something in Entertainment Weekly about uh, a list of things he'd read and had loved over the summer, and he mentioned one of my books, and then he had. Um, Done this, uh, we had sent him a copy of my book, an early copy of Trust Your Eyes, and he wrote this amazing um, cover blur for us for that. And uh, I finally got, I've met him twice. And it was funny, the first time I had, I was, it was when he was um, touring for Dr. Sleep and he came to Toronto. And in Dr. Sleep, that novel, which is the sequel to The Shining, there is a reference to a Google Street View type website called World 360 that these bad guys use to hunt down this girl. Well, World 360 is, doesn't exist, except in the pages of my novel, Trust Your Eyes. So he took awesome. this website that I created and put it into his book. And then in a later book had actually name dropped, you know, and said one of the characters was reading a little Barkley novels. But so I met him the first time, he said, did you catch the reference? And I went, yeah. <laughs> No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, you know, so I've met him a couple times. Uh, he's and and I every once in a while I get an email out of the blue from him, and and uh, you know and, and so he and he's and he's actually read. I had written this is a long story, but I've written another novel that hasn't come out that's more like a Michael Crichton thriller, not what I okay. Used. My yeah. public was trying to figure out what to do with it, and we think we finally got a plan. But I mean, I had sent a copy of it. He wanted to read it. So I'd sent it to him and he had loved it. And, and so every once in a while, if he sees an article that's sort of related to that subject matter, he'll send it to me. And so, forth. but you know, if you told me when I, I was that. in movie theater with my wife in the, in the late seventies watching Carrie, that this guy would, I would, you know, would be a, a fan and that I would have any, even this kind of slim connection, I would just, I've been just amazed. And he's a very generous, very decent guy, and not, and not just to me, he's very supportive of so many authors and emerging authors, and he reads an awful lot of stuff. And so he's a real booster for a lot of people. I would say that's true of you too, Linwood. I mean, I, I would say that's true of you. You're very generous of self. Like you, you, you know, you, you've always responded to me, uh, even on, you know, through Twitter, you know, I, I, the first time you, I, I actually interacted with you was when you were at Fogo Island with your wife and you guys, right. <laughs> I thought you owned the Fogo Island. I thought that was yours. <laughs> oh, he owns, yeah. he owns his great in. <laughs> you did an offer, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but you have always been generous in terms of your support of, of, of authors as well. I know you attend all of the book, events and I know you're you just are a big uh, a big a big person who mentors others and so I think if you think about all the reinventions you've had in your life is there anything that you want to help our listeners understand about that journey to make them understand the importance of reinventing on a regular basis not just once but you know as often as you need to you know I guess it's you know it's, I'm not I'm a pretty cautious guy and and uh not, not I, would, I would say conservative, not politically, but conservative in terms of life decisions. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
but I think every once in a while you have to be willing to take a chance. I think of, of any sort of major moves that I have made, and I even feel this way at the start of every book, I always think it's like standing at the edge of a really cold pool. And it's that just, can I jump into it and do it or not? You know, and you just, you sort of dip your toe in and think, oh man, that's just freezing. And, <laughs> and then finally you think, I'm just going to jump in. And I think that's kind of the way that you have to, to occasionally make that kind of decision. You have to jump into the cold water and see what can happen. And, and I've done that. I mean, I did that at the age of 22. Um, I certainly did it when I decided to leave the Toronto Star at, in 2006. And, and, you know, and, and like I say, leaving that, uh, leaving, running the, that camp, I mean, I could have still been doing that forever. You know, one of my duties there, but it was going to tell you, one of my daily duties through the summer at the camp was to bury fish guts. And I've always keep looking for there's some sort of metaphor in that, but I would have to, people, guys would clean their fish at the bottom of the lake and they would, on this table, and they would dump all the stuff in this can. And I had to lug it into the woods, Ugh. bury it <laughs> under dirt in this pit that we had to get rid of the fish guts because the garbage bin didn't really want to pick that up. And, and probably one of the most despairing moments of my entire life was when I was carrying the bucket of fish guts past our house to take it to the woods and the bottom gave way and fish guts went everywhere all over the road. And you'd think it couldn't get worse than that. And then my dog came over and rolled in it. So <laughs> I think if we, I think if we get through that, you can get through just about anything. <laughs> yes, there's, there's some words of wisdom right there. What book number are you on right now? What, Sorry? Number, are you right? what book number are you on uh, right now? Listen, I kind of lose track. I think I'm on 21 or 22. Um, I, think, I think that the Find You First is the next book and it comes out in, I think February 4th in the UK. Um, and it won't be out here in North America till May. And we had a couple of, first of all, we were, this 2020 was the first book, first year from 2004 where I didn't actually have a novel out in that calendar year because we had delayed the fall publication at first just because we wanted to avoid the U.S. election and how that would suck all the options. Yeah. So it was going to sort of come out in January. And then the pandemic pushed so many books further down the pipe. Mm -hmm. So now my next thriller here is it Find You First comes out in May. And um, and I think we're going to do my sort of different Michael Crichton -y book uh, as uh, as an ebook later in the year, and then the book that I'm writing now, and I'm uh, just about finished the first draft, will come out in 2022. It's just in this first draft. This first draft of a book to me is like a car that comes off the assembly line, and every screw is loose, every bolt is loose, the clean rattles like crazy. It's got paint scratches all over it. But it's come off the line, and now I have to go back and fix all the defects and things that are wrong with it. But I think I'll have that probably ready by January. I have to ask the question. When you phoned your, um, your publisher and said, I've got this idea, a girl wakes up, her family's gone, she doesn't know what's happened, if they've just left her or they've been killed or what's happened. And you didn't know what the ending was. You didn't know what the actual answer was. When did it come to you what the answer was? At what stage? Yeah, I had an answer before I started writing. I mean, I started making okay. some notes and I, and my agent actually had one idea. She said, what if it was maybe this? And then, and I thought, oh, I think I can make that work. And so I, before I start writing a novel, I want to know where I'm going to end up there. You know, every writer I know is different. I mean, I interviewed Ian Rankin for a festival a few weeks ago. We've, we've done a lot of events together. And Ian just starts writing. He doesn't know where it's going to go. And, and then someone like Michael Connolly, my understanding is he knows the whole thing, what's going to happen, has it all figured out. And I'm kind of in the middle. I, I know my sort of hook and my starting point. And I know where I want to end up. But there's this big mushy middle, I call it, of a book that I haven't quite worked out. So, um, but, I, but, but something like that book, no, which was No Time for Goodbye, I needed to know what I had to know what happened to that family before I started writing. You know, you just, I, maybe we end there because I actually think you've just, you've just nailed the process of reinvention. We know where we're starting from. We know where we want to end up, but it is mushy in the middle. There is, there's life gets in the way and things happen and you don't, can't predict all the storyline. Um, but, but keeping focused on. 
it's like I think you wouldn't you wouldn't start building a house without some blueprints and yet and a good solid foundation. You know, you would start with that. But then once the walls start going up and everything, you think, you know what? You, you think, well, we can we can make some changes. We can do this and that. But you've got to start sort of really well grounded. Right, right. Well, listen, I, I your storytelling has entertained me, kept me engaged. I, 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 I love your writing. I, <clears throat> I love your books. <clears throat> Sorry. I, I have nothing but respect for who you are as a person, Linwood. I, I really, I really, I'm, I'm really enjoyed this conversation. I, I could talk to you for a lot longer. I always find myself in these conversations wishing that we could just continue talking because you, you've taught me so much just in this short hour that we've had together, but you've also taught me how to use my imagination. And, and I don't think we are creative enough. I don't think we allow ourselves creativity and, and the opportunity to, to just remember what it's like to play with uh, our minds in a way that's in a, you know, who knows what we could be. So I, I thank you for that. I thank you for the entertainment. Yeah, right back at you because we've been admirers for a long time. Well, say say hello to your family and and thank you for uh, thank you for everything you do and thanks for the time today. It's been a pleasure. Life is similar to the twists and turns of a thriller. No matter how much you prepare and how great of a plan you may have, the unexpected tends to happen. That can be a permanent redirection or, in the case of Linwood, a temporary detour. The greatest thing we can do in these situations, though, is to take the learnings and apply them to our current situations and grow. The mentorship and wisdom that was passed on from the regulars at Linwood's family resort helped him think differently and ultimately break free of the routine that wasn't for him. Whether you find yourself obligated to follow a path that was predetermined or unexpectedly find yourself in a situation that you don't want to be in, know that your current situation is not your final destination. Stay safe and stay human. Thanks for listening, everybody. This podcast is made possible by the great folks at Venture Communications. Thanks to our engineers, writers, producers, and all the folks who work really hard to bring you these great stories of reinventions each and every week.